Good morning. Keep your Bibles open to Romans. I want to start with the last two verses of Romans chapter 2 before we go into chapter 3. We looked at this last week. For he is not a Jew. This is uh, chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. As we start chapter 3, we need to realize that Paul has already set the stage and laid the foundation of where humanity stands in the sight of God. That what we inherited from Adam and Eve after the fall is a nature that is contrary and actually at war with God and His truth. And that in that nature, in chapters 1 and 2, he loves the heathen under sin and says because they don't know God, they had the opportunity to know God, but they chose not to. They are under sin. They deserve to be punished. And then, for all of the religious people who were thinking to themselves, yes, the heathen deserve punishment, Paul says that they too deserve the same punishment because they too do the same sins as what the heathen do, and yet they know better. That's called hypocrisy. That's what we looked at last week. And God in His mercy lumps them all together and puts them into one boat and hopes that they understand their need of a Savior. And that that Savior can never be found inside oneself, but it has to come from outside to come inside. So, what we find in chapters 1 and 2 is Paul and part of 3, because he's going to go through this again, Paul lays out a really bleak commentary about humanity outside of Jesus Christ. But chapter 3 is one of the greatest chapters in the entire Bible because you see the gospel explained very clearly that a righteousness that comes from God is now available to us. God sees our situation. God knows our situation. And God loves us in that situation enough to take us out. So, let's continue on. He lays this foundation. And I love the way Paul structures his writings because Paul anticipates the questions that are going to come. And he asks those questions, and he gives you an answer. How much better can it get? You say, and how much clearer can it be? So as we look at this, it says in chapter 3, verse 1, What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the prophet of circumcision? Because he already went through in the last part of chapter 2 that circumcision of the flesh will avail how much? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. That the circumcision that God gave to Abraham was a symbol of circumcision of the heart. That you start to understand that Paul goes over this over and over again in Romans and in Galatians, that this flesh profits nothing. That in the sight of God, you can never, ever do enough good works to ever pay for one sin, one, let alone multiple sins. Do you realize that if you were to put your life in a balance, in a scale, okay, and you have one sin, and you have a million good works, when it comes to God, what weighs more? That's right, because the wages of sin is what? But you need to realize, we look at sin as something we do. God sees sin for what it really is, and that is the condition. Do you understand? This is why Paul writes chapters 1 and 2, because he's talking about the condition of sin, and that's why we need to save him. 
because you're either a slave to two powers. You're either a slave to Satan or a slave to Jesus Christ. Those are your two choices. The question is, is who do you choose? A lot of people say, well, I don't like either one, so I'm not going to choose. Well, you've already chosen. Right? You're either Christ or you're not. And that not is a really, really big bucket. That if you're not Christ, then you fit into that bucket and that saves. Okay? So, let me share some things with you. This is a book from E.J. Wagner. It's called Wagner on Romans. And this was written back in the late 1800s. Okay? 1895. 1896. Is that a long time ago? Yeah. But listen to how he writes this. So we finished up chapters 1 and 2. He says it's not really correct to say that we have finished the study of these two chapters because we can never finish the study of any portion of the Bible. After we have put the most profound study upon any portion of the scriptures, the most that we have done is only a beginning. If Newton you guys remember who Newton was? He wasn't the dude that made thing Newtons. Okay? This, is, this, is, this is Sir Isaac. If Newton, after a long life of study of natural science, could say that he seemed to be as a child playing on the seashore with a vast ocean before him unexplored, with much more aptness can the same be said by the greatest students of the Bible. Let no one therefore think that we may have by any means exhausted this portion of the book. When the reader has the text well in mind, and this hit me hard, think about this. When the reader has the text well in mind so that he can quite distinctly recall any passage at will and can locate it with reference to the connection, that's my goal. Listen to what he says. That's my goal. Okay? But he says when you achieve that, You can recall any passage at will and can locate it with reference to the connection. He has just got to where he can begin to study for real profit. Yeah, wow. I read that at least 12 times to figure out, wow. John. Yes. An illustration is somebody handed you a letter and said, okay, you can read the uh, last couple of lines in this letter and that's it. And, and, and you're supposed to, you know, figure out what the rest of the letter is. Yeah. Think about what he just said, because... Do you realize the Bibles that you have today, if you brought Bibles, the Bibles that are in your pew, do you realize how much blood has been spilled over the centuries so that you have the privilege of actually having them in your house, having them in front of you, having them in your lap? Do you know how much blood has been spilled for that? Do you realize that those men and those women and those children who spilled that blood were willing to do it so that you and I can have this privilege today? And we have all this and we have the Bible so accessible to us that it sits and it collects us. Is that what they gave their lives for? How much time do you spend on your cell phone, on your computer? And how much time do you spend in the actual Word of God? I read this, and I read this, and it cut me to my heart. I would just like to be able to remember, I can remember scripture, but the book, I can usually remember the book, but the chapter and the verse and the letter and the number things, that's really tough. Really tough. A lot of times they're not. <laughs> what you read and what you see up here is sometimes two different things. And when you read this, then when you get to that point, then you can actually start to really study. Therefore, let the reader who is anxious to acquire an understanding of the Scriptures for himself dwell upon the words as though he were digging in a sure place for treasure, and an inexhaustible one awaits his search. The second chapter is really summed up in the first verse. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, or inexcusable, O man, Whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein you 
judge another, you condemn yourself. For you that judge another, do you do the same things yourself? The remaining verses are but an amplification of this statement. Thus we find that there is no exception to the fact that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Hearing and knowing the truth, listen to this, hearing and knowing the truth is not a substitute for practicing it. No amens? Seriously? Amen. No amens? Amen. Listen to this. Hearing and knowing the truth is not a substitute for practicing it. God is no, what? Respecter of persons, but will punish sin wherever it is found. There's one thing you remember of anything I say today. Remember this last verse. That God is no respecter of persons, and sin will be punished wherever it is found. Did Jesus come to save you in your sin or from your sin? So as we get to verse or chapter 3, let's look at 3. Paul asks some questions. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? And then he answers that question. He says it's much in every way. How? Chiefly because to them, that's to the Jews and to the nation of Israel, were committed the oracles of God. Before I go on, I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 and 9. How is Paul able to anticipate these questions as he's writing this letter to the church of Rome? How is he able to anticipate these questions? You need to know his background. Okay? So turn to Philippians chapter 3. Now let's read verses 2 through 9. Linda, can you read that for me? Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 through 9. Yes, get the glasses. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as the law, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is the law in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Mm. How far? Tonight. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Amen. So listen, you came to the Sabbath school class, you would have heard this text given and read and explained. So let me make a pitch for the Sabbath school class. We're going through the book of Galatians. All are invited. If you come, you will be blessed. If you don't come, you will lose a blessing. We can set it out before you. The choice is yours. Okay? So, how is Paul able to know and anticipate these questions? Well, what you find in Philippians is because Paul used to be a Pharisee, right? And that he understood their mindset. He understood righteousness in the flesh. A righteousness... That was a false righteousness. He understood a false zeal. He was so zealous that he persecuted the church. He gave you his pedigree. That he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was also a Pharisee of the Pharisees. You know who he was taught by? Who he sat at the feet of? 
Starts with a G. Don't ask me. Yes. Don't ask me to pronounce that name. Paul was an excellent student, an excellent Pharisee, had a great pedigree, and when he came face to face with Jesus Christ, all that became what? Rubbish. That he counted it as nothing if he could get the surpassing grace, glory, and righteousness from Jesus Christ. Amen? Do you understand what made him turn that 180 degree? That he was able to say what these dogs that come from the circumcision, what they're wanting to teach you, this false gospel that they represent. That used to be me. I used to teach that. I used to believe it. And I was zealous for it. But now I have seen the truth. And that truth is Jesus Christ. Amen. And all this other stuff is rubbish. It's garbage. It's dumb compared to the righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Wow. Brothers and sisters, do you think that changed Paul's life? Do you think that started a fire in the hearts of the Roman believers when they read this? And why doesn't it affect us today? Hard hearts? Yes. Do you want to know why? Do you want to know why? I can the answer. We all know it. Just don't want to face it. Sin. What does sin do? Sin hardens our hearts against God. It blinds us. We live in a day and an age where we're really comfortable with sin. Nothing shocks us anymore. Nothing surprises us. And yet, God has called us to be what? Pure and holy. Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. What does that word perfect mean? It starts with an M. Mature, right? Are we not to grow up into Christ? To we're that perfect man? That perfect man that actually represents him and reflects him? But that is the weakness of the church today. We have all this head knowledge, but it doesn't touch our hearts. And we are so comfortable with sin that we have no power. God's word has no power in us. That's not God's fault. Paul's going to make this argument a little further on in these statements. It's us. Spirit of Prophecy tells us that before Christ comes back, what is the greatest work that the church needs to do? The putting away of sin. Right? That's not something God is going to do for you. God will give you that victory, but you have to choose to actually give everything to Him. Does God, let me sure I phrase this right, does God give you the power to sin? Let me phrase that again, or I'll ask you it again. Does God give you the power to sin? So, choice. So, if you sin, who's doing it? God in you? Right? It's you. Correct? So, to put away sin, what must we do first? We must make the choice. Now, if I'm a slave to sin and i got to put away sin, how do I accomplish that? And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. Right? Because either I'm a slave to sin and the devil, or I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. And if I want to put away sin, then I have to embrace Him. And He has to become my all in all. And here's our problem today. I have to get up tomorrow, and I know I have to go to work. I have all that planned out, okay? So I know that I have to be in bed at a certain time tonight, get a good night's sleep, to be able to do my work tomorrow. I'm going to get up, I'm going to get my truck loaded, get everything ready, make sure my guys are ready, and go do my job. And when I'm at my job, I'm going to make sure everything is done. And then when that's done, I have to answer all the phone calls that come in, work all those problems that come through the day. Now, everything I said, that's about maybe 9.30 in the morning. But where's Christ at in all of it? 
That's our problem. Mm -hmm. Okay? And this is what the devil has done. Very good at his deceptions. So that's 9 o'clock. Now I'm going to work all the way until 7 o'clock that night. Okay? Where's Christ in all of this? When do I have the time to really get a relationship with him? <laughs> to be able to study, to know the text and the verse well enough that I can repeat it, go right to it, and then actually start a real study. Okay? How busy are we? Now, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me. Because I know that's my issues and my problems. But I thank God that He loves me and He continues to show me a better way. And that way is Jesus Christ. And what He's teaching me and showing me and telling me is I need to submit. God's not telling me to quit my job. He knows I've got to feed my family. But what He's telling me is to put Him first. Amen. And that throughout all that busyness and that hectic pace and schedule, allow Him to be there to minister to me, to talk to me, and to reveal to me His truths that are contained in His Word. But if I don't know His Word, right? So that was Philippians 2 through 9. Let's turn to Romans and once again look at verses 1 through 2. Here's the question. What advantage then has the Jew or what is the prophet of circumcision? And we find out that Paul says, much in every way. Why? Because if you understand the truth about circumcision and why God gave it to Abraham, you realize that God was trying to teach a lesson. A lesson of how we are to relate to God, how we are to approach God, and what God requires from us. God does not require you to follow a set of rules. God wants your heart. Because following a set of rules, will that save you? Will that ever produce righteousness in you? Why is it that we like to follow a set of rules, though? Because that actually appeals to my fallen nature. It says, I can do this. I have a part in this. Do you know how many people have come to me over the years that we've been teaching this? Who says, you know, you guys, you just keep talking about you have nothing to do with this. God does it all. You have something. And I said, well, tell me, what is it that we have to do? What can you do to make God love you more? What? Yes. Not What's that? Not sin. Not sin. How do you like that answer? Out of the mouths of babes, but how do you not sin? You figured that one out? There you go. To have a pure heart, for me to have a pure heart, I need a heart transplant. Because this heart that I was born with, there is nothing pure in it. Right? And, and, and the older I get, the more I realize how dark and, and how unholy it is. Mm -hmm. But I've been walking with Jesus Christ now for almost three decades. And what I find in Christ <laughs> is that he has given me a heart transplant. And that he's given me a new nature. And that this nature that he gives allows me to see His law, which we find further on in Romans, is just, and it's good, and it's holy, and we find out it's also righteous. See, if you would have came to the Sabbath school class, you would have heard it, right? So, is there a problem with God's law? So, where's the problem at? The problem's in my heart, right? So, Christ gives me a heart transplant, and before Christ, I looked at the law and said, I don't want anything to do with that. Then I came to Christ and I looked at the law and went, oh my goodness, I start to grasp what perfection is, and that perfection is Jesus Christ. And if I'm called to that standard, 
I'm saying, I will never, ever, ever attain that. And God finally pats me on the back and says, you're starting to get it. Because you will never, ever attain this. But he draws me in close, picks me up, and gives me a hug, and lets me know, listen, I'm going to give you my righteousness. Is there any other higher righteousness than God's? And this is what we're going to find out as we continue on in Romans chapter 3. That a righteousness apart from the law comes from God himself. What does God want to give you? His righteousness. And if you have His righteousness, is there anything else you need? And did I work for that righteousness or did He give it to me? What's my part in that? <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm finally getting that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So when these people ask me, When you talk about, you know, this is what God has done, and it's all God, you've got to put that butt in there. Because if they don't hear it, that Pharisee just goes nuts inside of them. Right? But you have to start to understand, this is why we fall in love with Jesus Christ. This is why we submit to Him, and this is why we're willing to be His slave. Because there is nothing that I can do except fall at His feet. Ask for His mercy and allow Him to pick me up. Give me His righteousness. Let me actually listen to Him tell me how much He loves me. Amen. You know that's the hardest one of the hardest things for us to do? You ever ask yourself why that is? See, I've told you this before. I can understand why God would love you. But I don't understand why He loves me because I know me. You know what I'm saying? I know me, and, and, and what I know is that he knows me even better than I know me. And yet, he still loves me. And, and, and over the years, I'm starting to actually get a lot more comfortable with that. When I came into this church, I told you, I came into this church, and I heard a lot about the law. And I heard the importance of the law, and the importance of the law keeping but it was divorced from Jesus Christ. And do you know how hard it is to try to live up to a standard that you'll never ever meet? So we become actors. Do you know what another word for actor is? Do you know what the old word for definition for actor is? Hypocrite. hypocrite. That's right. I was a really good hypocrite. On the outside, I looked really good. But on the inside, I was a train wreck. You know, mess. And it took, it took years. And listen, I studied the Bible. I read the Spirit of Prophecy. But when I listened and looked at some of the leaders and teachers who were pillars in the church, had to play that acting game. And it drove me crazy. Do you know I left this church for years? Because of those reasons? When I came back, when I came back because God spoke to my heart, I actually went to a, uh, an Alliance Missionary Church. You play with them? Because uh, that's where most of my family were. I stayed there for a couple of years. My brother finally asked me because I did not talk there. They had Bible study. I did not speak at all. And if I did speak, it was something that they could actually agree with. And outside of that, I didn't say anything because I wasn't there to call, and I could have caused a lot, a lot. But what I needed was I needed I needed to be shown Christ's love. Now, isn't that a shame that I had to go outside of this church to see that? <laughs> Find that in a, in a Sunday keeping church. And I found it there, but my brother asked me one day, how long are you going to sit here and listen to these things that you know, that you know are now, this is my brother telling me this. 
that you know, that you know long. And it's like, yeah. But I didn't know where else to go, but God was calling me. You know who he was calling me to? Here. And I said to God, I don't want to go there. No. I don't want to go there. And the reason why, as I told you that, you know, the average age was like in the high 80s. You come back here, you're going to spend all your time doing hospital visits or funerals. You know what I'm saying?